Welcome. I'm calling to order this meeting of the Arlington Select Board on Monday, November 21st, 2022. I am Select Board Chair Leonard Diggins, and I will now confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. John Hurd? Yes. Steve DeCourcy? Yes. Eric Helmuth? Yes. And Select Board Vice Chair Diane Mahan will not be joining us tonight. Staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Sandy Pooler? Yes. Doug Heim? Yes. Ashley Meyer? Yes. Tonight's meeting of the Arlington Select Board is being conducted in a hybrid format consistent with Chapter 107 of the Acts of 2022, signed into law on July 17, 2022, which further extends certain COVID-19 measures regarding remote participation until March 31, 2023. Before we begin, please note the following. First, this meeting is being conducted via Zoom. It is being recorded and is also being simultaneously broadcast on ACMI. Second, persons wishing to join the meeting by Zoom may find information on how to do so on the town's website. Persons participating by Zoom are reminded that you may be visible to others and that if you wish to participate, you are asked to provide your full name in the interest of developing a record of the meeting. Third, all participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment and those persons are not required to identify themselves. Both Zoom participants and persons watching on ACMI can follow the posted agenda materials also found on the town's on the town's website using the notice agenda platform. And finally, each vote tonight will be taken by roll call. So let's see how much of the town's business we can get done this evening, and we will now turn to item number two on the agenda, which is the consent agenda, which includes meetings of the meeting, minutes of the meeting for October 24th, 2022, and a request for a special one day beer and wine license on November 26th at Robinson Memorial Town Hall for a private event by Patrick Curran. Move approval. Second. So on a motion to approve by Mr. Corsi and a second by Mr. Hurd. Discussion? All right, Mr. Hyde. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Hellman? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Great. Now we move on to a public hearing. And, and the first item at this point is essentially moot. It will be included as a page in in the discussion and vote on the property tax classification tax tax rate. And, and so we'll turn to uh, this Mary Stanley Connor, chair of the Board of Assessors. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the Board of uh, Selectmen and Mr. Town Manager. Um, on behalf, I'm here on behalf of the Board of Assessors, and with me I'd like to introduce the other members of the Board of Assessors. Uh, Mr. Zagata, um, Gordon Jamison, the Vice Chair of the Board of Assessors, uh, and we have Mr. Mann, who will actually, the Director of Assessments, who will actually present the classification information to you to make a determination. But before I do so, um, I just want to say um, that Mr. Mann, who is the new exec director of the Board of Assessors, has done a very good job this year. Uh, and his uh, there are three other members in the department. As the select board may very well know, the Board of Assessors, that department, the uh, assessing department, is one of the smallest group of employees with one of the biggest tasks uh, and important tasks on behalf of this town. Um, and they do it efficiently, uh, and they do it every year. We have never had a late classification hearing or a late tax bill go out in this town. I also want to thank my colleagues on the Board of Assessors. Mr. Zagata is, as you know, an appraiser, and he brings that to the Board of Assessors. Mr. Jamison is very well versed in finance and in the workings of town government. He brings that, and I'm an attorney, so it's a very well-balanced Board of Assessors, I would suggest to you. Uh, and I'd like to introduce Mr. Uh, Mann, who will present to you the classification uh, report. So, Dana? Thank you, Mary. Uh, good evening, uh, I'm just, I'm just, members of the Sorry board. to interrupt you. I'm just going to ask you to point the microphone up to you. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. It helps ACMI. Yeah. Thanks. And uh, good evening, uh, staff. Uh, the purpose of this hearing is for the Board of Assessors to provide information to the Board of Selectmen regarding the tax rate options uh, that are available to the town under the classification um, under property tax classification. Um, there will be votes to determine the share of the levy to be borne by each class of property. You all have a booklet. Um, the booklet is numbered 
these days, uh, which is different from the past. Hopefully that uh, makes it easier for you all. We can start on page one, which is a, essentially a, an overview of the information that goes into the tax rate. Um, so we start with the previous year's tax uh, levy limit uh, of one, 130,000, I'm sorry, 130,879,853. We add to that the proposition two and a half uh, rate uh, amount of $3,271,996. Uh, we add to that amount the new growth for 2023 in the amount of $1,000,000. $205,059. That creates a levy limit of $135,356,908. Uh, moving along, the levy limit is then added, um, or I should say the, the school debt exclusion, which is outside of Proposition 2.5, voted um, at town meeting. Uh, the amount is $13,848,434. And that gives us a maximum total to be raised of $149,205, I'm sorry, $205,342. So to calculate the tax rate, we take the amount to be raised of $149,169,849 um, and we divide that by the total taxable assessed value of $13,306,855,407. Uh, multiplied by 1,000, we get the tax rate of $11.21. Uh, the excess levy is $35,493. And please uh, feel free to stop me as we go along. I'm happy to answer any questions. So beginning on page two, and also continued on page three and four, is what, what is um, allowed for in terms of a shift in tax levy uh, from the commercial, industrial, and personal property, um, actually the other way around, from the residential and open space classes to the commercial, industrial, and personal property classes. So on page two, you can see that the current makeup or percentage of the classes in column D we have the residential class at 94.5277%. The commercial entities, uh, including the industrial and per personal property, uh, make up 5.4723%. The DOR has then provided for us uh, calculations to determine what's called a residential factor, a minimum residential factor. Uh, we are only allowed to move that shift by a certain amount. And if you turn to page four, the amount, the percentage amount of the shift can be no more than 8.2085%. Now, what does that mean? <laughs> On page five, we have some more informative information. Um, so the top line, is everyone there? Uh, page five, the top line, or 100% on the left side, um, would equate to the CP CIP percentage that we talked about of 5.4723%. The residential, an open space shear 
would be 94.5277%. This would be a factor of one, meaning no shift. That would create an interest rate of 11.21% for all classes. I'm sorry, thank you, tax rate. If we were to shift 5% of that available amount to be shifted, we can see in the next column that the CIP share would go up to 5.7459%. The residential and open space share would go to 94.2541%. The tax rate for the commercial, industrial, and personal property would go to $11.77. Correspondingly, the residential and open space tax rate would go down three cents to $11.18. Now, in terms of taxes, what that would mean is the CIP, commercial, industrial, and personal property, would their taxes would increase $280, while the re residential and open space tax amount would go down $16.22. So we see that there's, there's a difference based on the ratio of commercial to, to residential property. And I have taken the liberty of, of running those numbers in 5% five, five increments up to the maximum allowable, that 8.2085%. So we can see in the last example, or the maximum amount of shift, the tax rate for the commercial, industrial, and personal property would be $16.82. The residential rate would be $10.89. And the tax amount, the increase for commercial, industrial, and personal property would be $2,803. And the residential and open space uh, would have a discount of $162. Any questions regarding? tax rate shift. So with, within the classification options that are available, spelled out by the DOR, uh, the first is the residential exemption. This would allow for a shift within the residential class uh, up to 35%. Um, of the average residential value um, from lower valued properties and moving that burden to higher valued properties. So up above, there's a chart there. We start on the left-hand side. We see the residential average assessment is $849,335. That's all residential property, including zero lots, uh, land. Um, and we have a total number of parcels of 14,810 in the residential um, class. So the top line would represent no residential exemption. Uh, so we see that the residential assessment total is 12 billion 578,000, I'm sorry, 578 million, uh, $665,911. The levy for the residential class is $141,006,845. The tax rate would be $11.21. As we apply the discount, so the second line represents a 20% uh, reduction for the residential exemption. 
We've estimated the eligible accounts at 13,047. We multiply 20% of that residential average assessment by the total eligible accounts, and we get a total value exempted. That's 2.2 uh, I'm sorry, 2 billion, 216 million, 254,749. Uh, so that would be discounted or reduced uh, from the total residential value to get a new total residential value of 10,362,411,162. The levy stays the same. That's the important part. The levy does not change. That would indicate a tax rate or change the tax rate to $13.61. And you see I've laid out some variations in the percentage. So the break-even point, meaning the value of the home that would see neither an increase nor a uh, decrease, is $963,287, which is approximately $40,000 over the average single family home, just to give you some reference there. Um, However, it would leave approximately 17% of the remaining parcels to to shoulder the additional weight of the discount because the levy does not change. Uh, And obviously, most homes in Arlington are owner occupied. Um, Along with that, I would note that um, we see a lot more trusts, uh, ownership uh, trusts, where um, that may impact this eligibility. So you may have a resident who qualifies um, as being um, a homeowner who lives in Arlington. However, if they were to put their home in a trust and did not have both a beneficial and a, an ownership interest, that trust would not qualify. Something to consider. Any questions on the residential exemption? Well, this may not be the kind of question you can answer, and that's fine. You know, um, would the... 70% mean, shouldering b- b- sh- sh- an extra burden, would they most likely be houses that were purchased more recently? So they would be higher, I'm sorry, um, they would be higher valued homes, which would include more recent purchases because values have been going up. So yes. Okay. All right, thanks. Okay. So on page seven is um, the history of tax rates in Arlington. And we can see that historically, the town has chosen a single tax rate. If there had been a shift here, it would be noted. Okay, on page eight, uh, if there's no questions, I'll move along. What we have here is the actual classification report. Uh, This comes right out of the DOR website uh, after we enter the totals from our CAMA system. And so it shows you the values in each class of property. Does anyone have any questions on the, I'm sorry, I don't have a very good description because this comes out of the DOR, Uh, but on the left-hand side of the property types, um, and just to the right of that, we have the parcel counts within that classification, and we have the uh, the value. (coughs) And at the bottom, we have have totals for the major uh, classes. Uh, 
Uh, the next page, page um, nine. Yes, page nine. Uh, this is the tax base levy growth. So this describes where the growth came from uh, within the cal uh, classifications, within the categories. It also indicates the amount of abatements by class. So you can see the total uh, residential abatement amount. And this was, this, uh, there was a significant abatement um, in the 111 class, which is the apartment class. Um, and then we have a total. We, we have some, uh, the commercial abatement numbers and the total. And we have the growth, and we have the total. And so you can see that the growth total amount, that $1,205,059, is in the lower right-hand <coughs> corner. And on page 10, this is, um, this is what we call the comparison report. So this provides some good information year over year. So we see that um, in the 101 class, we, which is the single family class, we have a count, a parcel count of 8,008. That's down one from the previous year. And you can see the, the assessment, the assessed value in that category is up 8% for a total assessment of 7 million 306, I'm sorry, 7 billion 306 million 385,400 dollars. And here we have to the far right in that column, we have the previous year average single family assessment of $844,658. And moving down through the classes, um, we see there's some personal property. We do see some growth. We see a reduction in um, the 501 class of personal property, which would be uh, sole proprietorships and partnerships, rel relatively smaller personal property accounts, uh, where we do, did lose some parcels. But overall, in the personal property category, um, we end up up. Uh, almost 10%. Just to point out one thing that I think is relevant to my hearing, you can see from the commercial and industrial that those are negatives. Oh, oh, sorry. Just for ACMI, they, they, yep. they, they the, won't be. The commercial <laughs> and industrial numbers are negative. Um, it, we found that the values in Arlington are in the residential properties, um, and the commercial and industrial have not kept anywhere near pace with the increases in values. Thanks. Okay, so uh, moving down to the the major classes. Um, in terms of percentage increase or decrease, we see the residential class is up 6.55%, and this is in value. Um, and yes, we have some declines in commercial and industrial. Uh, and there's that 10.93% growth in um, personal property. And we can see up, up above that that the, the majority of that is in utility classes of personal property. And so we have grand totals. We have the 15,000 
865 uh, parcels in town. Any questions on? Okay, moving along. The tax rate component page. I believe that's page 11. This, um, this compares essentially the levy components from year to year. So we can see um, how the tax rate was built here. Uh, we start with a base levy of $9.83 per thousand. We add to that the 2.5% or 25 cents. And we add, uh, this year I do want to point out that there's no water and sewer debt exclusion, um, which would add to the levy. We see the school debt exclusion, and we see the cost of that, $1.04 on the ta tax rate. And that all adds up to the $11.21. Below that, we have the, uh, the actual numbers. Um, so the levy increase percentage, I think, is an important number. Uh, we see that in the middle of the page at 3.31%. Okay, total taxable assessed value um, down towards the bottom of the page. Um, we see that the total value of the town has increased to thirteen billion three hundred and six million eight hundred and fifty five thousand four hundred and seven dollars. Now here is where we have the average single family home. And we compare that year over year. So the new assessed value of the single family home is $912,385. And that is an increase in taxes of $582 year over year. And the last page, page 12, indicates, given all that, <laughs> when compared to, our, um, to other towns in our vicinity, um, we see that the tax rate is still significantly lower than Belmont, Winchester, and Lexington. And I apologize, I was not yet able to collect their information for this year. But this document resides on the assessor's web page, and it'll be updated. Any questions? Thank you for this. Thank you for the excellent uh, preparation of this. And thank you all for your work and to your staff as well. It's, as you say, as, as the chair said, it's um, not a big department, but it sure carries, punches way above its weight in the importance of, of what you're doing. Um, can you remind me and perhaps uh, those watching if uh, I see that we've we demonstrated that we've had a single tax rate in prior years. Uh, is the same true for the residential exemption? Yes, we have not had a residential exemption voted for. Thank you. So, any okay. further questions? So I, what I would ask the board to vote is what's called a factor of one which would mean no shift, would mean no residential exemption. We, ought, we technically have the option of what's called an open space discount, but we have no properties classified as open space, so that's mute. There is a small business exemption that would allow for up to 10% reduced from businesses that have less than 10 employees and, and the property is valued at 
uh, $1 million or less. However, um, one of the issues we find with, with that is the um, discount would go to the, to the property owner and not the small business. So I would ask a vote of a factor of one, um, uh, excluding a residential exemption, excluding the small business discount, excluding the open space discount. Sir? Do you want to take, see if there's public comment before we take a motion? Or? Yeah, because it, it is definitely a hearing. No, I appreciate that. That will make a motion. No, no, thanks for that. Thanks for reminding me. Just wanted to confirm. Can, can, no. I, can I make one clarification? Yes. Um, the Board of Assessors takes no position on classification. We just present, I think Mr. Mann is looking just for the vote. Uh, we take no position on classification. It is your decision. We just need to know what your vote is going to be so that we can submit to DOR. Appreciate that. Uh, well, we always take into account your wise counsel. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, and so um, I may have some questions, but why don't we go to the, the public, see if there are any questions or comments? At this time, there are no hands raised. Okay, great. Thank you. So, yes, Mr. Hurd. Thank you for the presentation and all the work. I don't, with the amount of properties and whatnot that you have to go through to put this together, my brain doesn't even want to grasp the amount of work that it takes to put this together. Um, I always find this to be our yearly reminder why we can't have a residential exemption and why we can't have a split tax rate, just because that 95% residential number just makes it incredibly unfeasible but it's also good to look at the numbers that we have as we're coming up on some tough decisions about what we do about our tax rate in the next year or two. And to show, again, we talked about this in our last meeting, in our last meeting that the only really way to absorb some of the impact of overrides from year to year under Proposition 2.5 is to find a way to create new growth. The only place that we have room for new growth in this town is in the residential area. So it's just food for thought to, as we come up with some projects or proposals that will come before, not necessarily this board, but other town committees, as it's particularly in the realm of affordable housing. So let's see if I can get this right. I make a motion to adopt a factor of one, which would include a, both a residential and commercial and industrial and- Which would not. Include. Well, so I'm saying at $11.21 as suggested. So every tax rate set at $11.21 um, without a residential exemption and without a separate tax rate for commercial, industrial, and personal property. And again, thank you for the presentation. It's uh, Interestingly, you look forward to this meeting <laughs> every year. I don't know why, but it, it feels like this information that usually Mr. Jameson's on the other side of the, the Zoom screen, but glad to have you here in person. <laughs> but um, again, thank you for the presentation, and uh, that's it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'll second Mr. Hurd's motion, and I want to thank the it's nice to have all of the board, members of the Board of Assessors here this evening. Thank you for coming to the hearing. Thank you, Mr. Mann, for the, for the presentation. I, I find this report and, and, and the information in it to really be fascinating how it ties in to what we're doing as a community in terms of how important tax levy growth is and, and what a high percentage it is for the community and how important the role of the, the assessor is when you consider assessor, Board of Assessors and the Director of Assessing when you consider how much value um, and, and that exercise that, that needs to take place every year. Just have a few comments and, and, and maybe a, a couple questions, but you know, on one of the things, and I, I thank you for taking the time, Mr. Mayor, too, for going through this. I think it was helpful for the public, and this is going to be, I believe, on the assessor's website, as you yeah. said. Um, as you mentioned, we're not shifting any, date, any debt this year for the first time to the um, Oh, from water and sewer onto the real estate tax. And at page 11, 
um, of your analysis, the tax rate components, uh, you can see what that effect was. Back in fiscal 2019, that was 58 cents on the 58 cents of the total tax rate. Um, and at the time, what we said is we know there is going to be more debt coming on for the schools because of the, the high school in, in, in Minuteman, and that by taking the debt off um, water and sewer and sending it back to the water and sewer bills, we can absorb the school debt. And, and you can see that 58 cents is now gone. Happy to say we won't have a vote to shift any date debt to zero. The school debt exclusion has gone from 43 cents to a dollar four. That's a 61 cent increase. It, it almost is a, is a direct wash over this time period. And, and that's a, exactly what we, we had talked about doing and, and it was recommended to us to do. So I'm, I'm pleased that we were, we were able to do that um, with, with recommendations from the town manager and, and um, you know, from, from, from various parties. The other thing I would say, when you look at the number of exempt parcels, and this is always something with water and sewer, believe the number of exempt parcels have increased from 857 to 861 between fiscal 22 and 23. And that was always one area. The exempt organizations pay water bills. They don't pay real estate taxes. So by bringing it back to them, they are paying for water and sewer not, and, and still getting the exemption um, for taxes. Um, another comment and then a couple of questions. Um, it, the LA 13 information is helpful in terms of what the growth was in the community in, in this past year, according to your report, which I imagine has already been submitted to DOR. There's $105 million in new growth across across the community, and, and you know, maybe as we go forward, there's a lot of projects that that number goes up. That's that's great, but we don't tell you what to do on that. It's it's your job to determine it every year, but it's. Um, that's where you really see that $1.2 million that is generated by new growth. That's outside of Proposition 2.5. It becomes part of the base next year. So it's, it's, growth is a good thing for communities and, and the, you know, if, it's, if it's responsible. One question for you, and, and this is maybe more assessment administration, but um, I've received a few inquiries lately in terms of tax deferral for people who may qualify. And, do you have any information on the number of um, property owners that may be seeking that tax deferral option? Yes, I do. It, the number is relatively small. The number is 16 properties uh, okay. that have entered into agreement to defer taxes. Um, so it is a yearly application. Those properties do have to reapply each year. Um, but we do have two new uh, applications this year that we've processed. Okay. All right. Good. Thank you. And um, I, I say I had a couple. I might have one or two oh, more yeah, comments, but I, I really get into this stuff. Um, looking at the tax rate table, also pleased to see this. This looks like the ninth year in a row that our tax rate is is going down, which which su suggests that 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 values we're going to get the two and a half percent increase, but the, the values continue. To increase and, and, and that uh, offsets uh, or, or allows the rate to come down a little bit. Right. right. So, yes, as values increase, the tax rate will go down. And we've had a significant period of, uh, re of residential values um, raising quite rapidly. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, and I think that's all I, I, I have. I appreciate the, 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 the time you took this evening. And just for the public's benefit, we talk about this every year. There's a lot of information that we receive, but this, again, this separation of duties, if you will. We're, we're here tonight, as you asked us, and as Mr. Hurd made the motion, we, we set the policy in terms of the rate and, and who bears the burden of the taxes. And that's really the extent of our job. Your, the valuation, exemptions, abatements, Treasurer's collection, um, and, and that, that, that's our role here. So thank you again uh, for the time, and a very nice job. Thank you. Thanks, and, and you can stay. stay. Thanks. So, so I, have, I just have a, some curiosity questions. You know, uh, so so uh, you, the, you compared us to um, three other communities. You know, uh, why, why those three? You know, it's, it's historical. Mm -hmm. um, these three properties go back at, at least a dozen years mm -hmm. in, this, in this booklet. 
Um, so I don't think it was um, a matter of selection, uh, but a matter of um, continuation. Yes, Mr. Pooler. I would just note two things. One, uh, these are the towns that are adjacent to us mm -hmm. and our towns as opposed to the two cities that are adjacent to us. Right. Uh, we also do a comparison of these tax rates with the so-called Town Manager 12 right. that you've seen, and we publish that every year in March in the uh, Town Manager's financial plan, so you can see how we compare to the communities uh, that we look at in terms of collective bargaining and so forth. But in terms of purely property issues, it's just looking at this plot of earth and <laughs> other towns around us, how do these compare? Yeah, yeah and I ask because, I mean, the, 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 the rates mean, and by that I actually mean the average mean that the, the property owners are paying are so, so different. I was just wondering <clears throat> mean, if there was anything that popped out that made them, them different, you know. And here's a, a technical kind of wonky question. That average, is it the mean, median? So no, oh. that would be the average of all of the property in the residential class. What, what, what that, their actual tax amount would be. Okay. So it, it's essentially the uh, average single family home right. multiplied by the tax rate. Okay, right. got it, yeah, thanks. You know, and and um, here's the real curiosity question. So there are these the several categories for personal property, you know, mm. and, and um, I think I know what that is, I mean, but, but just <clears throat> if you could give me like an example of, a, of what would be personal property in one or two of those categories, it would confirm whether or not I know what it, um, whether what I'm thinking is right. Sure. Um, so as I mentioned, the 501 class yeah. is um, sole proprietorships and partnerships. The 502 is um, business corporations. Right. The 503 are manufacturing um, properties. Right. Um, and then we get into the utilities, which um, can be um, pipes, underground pipes, um, and poles, tele telegraph poles. And then 508, we have cellular technology. Mm -hmm. um, I got it. And, and so it, it, was, um, it was more than what I thought, so I'm glad, I'm glad I asked that. And, and, and lastly, so, so you, you explained to us your, rash, your rationale, you know, because uh, after all, it is our decision, you know, but I think it would help me um, once again for a, those who are listening or will listen at some point in time and for us as a reminder mm -hmm. uh, as to why uh, we have in the past and will this time also you know not do a split you know uh, with respect to businesses mean and 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 residents <clears throat> uh, i'm sorry I, I didn't hear the question why why why, why we will not do a split I mean um split rates I mean um for businesses I mean so so we are or going to have a single rate I mean, for everyone I me mean, and I mean, if you could just give a quick summary of why that's a good practice or why we've done it in the past and why we're going to continue to do sure. it. Sure. So the DOR created these options because there are all sorts of towns with different um, classification rates or, or uh, ratios. So in, in certain cities, the ratio of commercial property to residential property um, is almost 50-50. In those cities and towns, it might make more sense to have a split rate where the city has a significant base of commercial entities um, and is not, not actively trying to recruit businesses to the city. Um, so it's a matter of um, the percentage and whether the town is seeking to attract businesses or not. And, and also you have certain, so it's based on home ownership and um, whether the property is your primary residence. So we have certain towns like down the Cape 
where you have a large percentage of um, non-owner occupied properties which can absorb um, I'm, I'm sorry actually that would be the residential exemption no um, I wanted that too so no, that's yeah. good good so thank you I got it yeah I, I thought maybe you just kind of silently segued over to that thank you that was that was that was helpful and, and, Yes, I'm Mr. Mr. Chair, if I can just be clear on one thing, just to make sure that in the interest of what you're saying for the people watching, this is ultimately the policy of the select board. It's your decision. It's a strange thing because these folks are such experts in everything about this, but technically speaking, to the extent that there is a split or there's not a split, that's purely a function of the select board's right. uh, jurisdiction. I just want to make sure that that's clear for everybody. Yeah. Can I? Can I? Yes, yes. I guess to to make it um, feasible uh, so people at home understand, say if we went to a split tax rate and you took the midpoint of 125%, would t that would mean that the tax increase on $500,000 of commercial property would be $1,401 and the taxpayers, the residential taxpayers would see an, a decrease in $81 a thousand. Would people, what would that do to what little commercial tax um, base we have here in Arlington, which is mostly small businesses? Would people want to see that burden shifted? Ultimately, they would pay for it in increased um, uh, costs and expenses. So there's that component to it when you, when you put it into the reality of it. This is, the, that page six, page five, gives you the reality of the impact it would have. And I just want to say one other thing is, uh, um, you know, you people have thanked us, but the, the values in this town continue to rise because the town is well run by the Board of Selectmen, the town manager, and town meeting. That is the reality of why we see these con increases here. So, you know, people in this town should be grateful for your management of this town uh, because their properties continue to expand at a very a rapid rate compared to other communities. I mean, some of the communities that are listed on this comparison sheet, ride through them um, on snowy days and see what the snow removal is like, and ride through the town of Arlington and see what a wonderful job the Public Works Department does in this town. So I think it, it, we should thank you people as well for that. Well, I guess you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for the comment. You know, so, uh, all right, and what's it, that's it for me, you know? And so, I mean, there is no way I'm gonna repeat back that motion. So on a, mo <laughs> so, so on a motion by Mr. Hurd and a second by Mr. DeCourcy, uh, Mr. Heim. I'm sorry, is there no further comment from any member of the board? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Heim? Yes. Mr. Davis? Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so we're moving on to item number five, Board of Commissioners Trust Funds, meaning obviously an appointment in, of uh, Angela Olszewski. So. Hello. And I'm sorry if I mispronounced your last name. Hi. Hi. Angela. How you doing? Sorry, I just I got invited to join as a panelist. Right, that's because we're discussing yep. your appointment. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, sure, I think I, think I know most everybody. Um, so I've served on a lot of committees in town. Um, I've been on the finance committee and capital planning. Um, I chair ATED um, and I was interested in um, serving on the trust fund commissioners. Um, you know, and I, I have a, a, a background in investment management um, too, so I thought that would be helpful. Um, and I'd just like to make another contribution to the town. All right, well, thank you very much, you know, so. Okay, I heard Mr. Hurd, sure. so I'm gonna go with him for the motion. And I so saw Mr. Corsi. I didn't raise my hand. You know, uh, <laughs> Move and, Second. Yeah, so uh, comments, questions? Uh, Mr. Chair? Yes. If Mr. I may, um, since I had the privilege of uh, working with Ms. Olszewski um, in my capacity 
as the CPA committee chair, um, liaison to capital planning, I was uh, became well acquainted with your good work there and um, read it off all the different things that you've done for the town. And we are indeed fortunate that you are uh, ready for more. So thank you for your service and for your uh, new commitment here. Thank you, Ms. Ellen. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So yes, once again, I mean, I'll just reiterate I mean, my appreciation. I mean, so thank you and looking forward to you know, your service here. You know? So on a motion by Mr. Hurd and second by Mr. Corsi, Mr. Hunt. Yes. Yes. Mr. Yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Take care. And so the next appointment is to the Zoning Board of Appeals, an alternate member to a voting member, uh, Benek Holly. Yep. Hello. Good evening, Hi. everyone. Hi. Hi. Did I pronounce your last name correctly? Benek Holly. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, so, uh, want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, um, um, my name is Venkat, and um, I'm currently serving as an associate member at the Arlington Zoning Board, and um, been up to the to service as serve as a zoning board member. I'm a registered architect, worked in Mass, you know, in um, Maryland, and then Massachusetts here. Currently, since past eight years, so over 16 years of experience as a registered architect. So, wanted to serve the community by being a board member and try to collaborate, you know, on. Um, guidelines and other things associated so that was the reason why um, I joined and be happy to serve right thank you so I turn mr. Hurd. a move approval and uh, just thank you for continuing your service I know when me and mr. de course had our phone conversation with you which was probably eight six months to a year back you yeah. told you at that time that you couldn't vote and you still said that's okay. I still want to serve and be involved and, and get to know the board. So I'm happy that you now can be involved and vote. So thank you for continuing to serve. No, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, and I second Mr. Hurd's motion. And nice to see you, Mr. Holy. We did the interviews by phone, so it's nice to see you here this evening. <laughs> I didn't and, Yes, it is. now it makes more sense to see everyone. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah. And, and we were very impressed at the time. We really appreciate your commitment to the to the ZBA, and I'm happy to support the, the uh, full membership. Thank you. Right. So, yes, I, mean, I remember me when we, we voted you as an associate member because it, uh, I saw that building it, uh, in, in Quincy. It, oh, yeah. and, you know, and and I was just thinking, can we have one of them? You know, so so I'll, so is that a, is that a triangular building? The one in the which building? The Chestnut Place? Yeah. Yeah. No, it was recently done. Yeah. No, it, it's a rectangular shaped building, but yeah, 16. So okay. that's supposedly okay, tall. Right. Okay. Cool. It almost looks like it's a triangular. So okay. All right. So it's no, a triangle. It, it, it's, it's a rectangle. <laughs> it's still fine. It's, it's still fine. You know, um, it's, it's a beautiful building, you know, and Thank you. I see you spent a lot of time in, in Baltimore. What brought you up to Boston, the Boston area, Arlington? Oh, uh, <laughs> mostly I, it was a good opportunity uh, with Perkins Eastman. That's where I started when I moved here and then moved on to another firm called the Architectural Team. But um, it was just an international firm I thought I should try out. So just one of those things packed up my suitcase and moved here. My wife happens to be in bio, so I never thought anything could go wrong there as well. So she's doing well, and we both are doing well, thank, thankfully. Oh, great. So. Well, well, thanks for settling in Arlington and, and being a, a yes. part of the ZBA. You, um, you have some big shoes to fill. I mean, uh, apparently, I know. Mills, I mean, um, uh, was a big contributor. Learning. And, and, yeah, uh, I'm uh, learning from Kristen and Pat. There's so much to learn, yeah. Yeah, great. yeah. The meeting has been such a delight to learn all those new things. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great team, and I think we're going to be sending some interesting things um, your way. So, so um, on a motion by Mr. Hurd and a second by Mrs. Corsi. Mr. Heim. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mrs. Corsi. Yes. Mr. Heim. Yes. Mr. Davies. Yes. Mr. Davies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Bye. So on to open forum. Except in unusual circumstances, any matter presented for consideration of the board shall neither be acted upon nor a decision made the night of the presentation in accordance with the policy under which the open forum was established. 
It should be noted that there is a three minute time limit to present a concern or request. Anyone in the queue? At this time, no. Okay. All right. So moving on to traffic rules and orders. Um, so future select board meetings. Uh, so Ms. Mahan isn't here, you know, but I think it's kind of obvious I mean, the dates that we should probably set for January um, and February. And the reason I'd like to do um, those sooner rather than later is that I know that the school committee is going to want to meet with us probably sometime um, in, in January. So it would be good for us to have our date settled so that we can kind of work around that as opposed to me saying, I think I know when it's going to be. So, so, um, so I'll get out my phone, you know. Anyone who wants to speak up to what they think they should be. <coughs> oh, Excuse my me. Calendar. I'm fine with that. So, Mr. Chair, it might look like the 9th and the 23rd might be good options for January. Yes. That's exactly what I was thinking. Yeah. And. Or. February, February two weeks. probably the 6th and the 27th, unless you prefer the 13th and the 27th, you know. Or we could do it Wednesday if we needed to. Uh, mm, uh, I don't have a strong yeah. feeling. Um, any preferences between the, the 6th and the 22nd or the 13th and the 27th? Is there any, how much downside is there if we do 6 and 27 to having a, a three week gap instead of a two? Ms. Marmer, Ms. Marmer, I have an opinion for your no, flow of board business. Ryan, you guys do pick the 22nd, that the 20th does not count as the 48 hours, so we would still have to. Oh, we still have to. The 17th yeah. in full. Right. No, I, I said the 22nd, I misspoke. I mean, I was saying the 22nd. No, no, that would be correct, though. That would be a Wednesday. No, I don't want to Wednesday. Yeah, so I wasn't, do, do not, no, do no, not no. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. I no, no, I misspoke, I mean, so, uh, so, so I'm 27th, I mean, I'm fine, he was asking me what would be the consequences of a three-week gap, you know, and, and, and also, I mean, he, uh, at that point, we won't be yeah. into more in our season, so I don't see a downside if you do want a three-week Right. That's totally up to the board's discretion, but I don't see it being. Yeah. But I think with our new Zoom option, in the event something requires right. us, we can notice a meeting, but I think yeah. we should be fine. Yeah, and, 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 and that's what I was thinking too, is that if it does get I mean, things to start, seem like they're piling up, we can just add another meeting uh, uh, pretty quickly, you know, so. Uh, yeah. Okay. So yeah. are we gonna do the six and 27 just for, so I don't know post? Yeah, let's do the 16th and 27th because what that does is that I mean, allows us to fall back to the 13th, Perfect. you know, so, because otherwise we then, you know, have the, the, the three-week gap already built in, so, so we have a two-week, yeah, uh, so, okay, you know, so they take care of January and February and, and, um, and probably in March, I mean, um, I'm thinking that we'll probably meet more frequently early on just to I mean, blow through the, yeah, I mean, Assuming we'll have another like 90 and so, and so, and 20 resolutions, you know, so, so all right, you know, so that takes care of that and, and uh, a quick um, follow up on Veterans Memorial Park. And so, so um, there was a comment in open forum uh, about the, that, that we should have I mean, had public comment because it should have been. <coughs> And so I talked with some council and he informed me that there was no need for that to be a hearing because it was just a, um, a proposal for us to approve so that Mr. Chung will go out and seek funding. You know, we can always accept public comment whenever we want, you know, and, and we, I'm inclined to do it more often than not, I mean, but it certainly wasn't a requirement. I mean, so if I didn't say something correctly or if you want to enhance what I said, Mr. Heim. No, Mr. Chair, I yeah. think that's a good summary. I, I guess the, 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 for the context, we're talking about trees. And to the extent that there's a public shade tree, and I, I'm not saying that there, there, I don't know that there was one, but to the extent there are public shade trees, you have to have 
a process for taking down any public shade trees. Uh, so folks should just know that if there's any public shade trees, including ones taken by the town, we have a process for doing that. I'm not sure that any of the ones involved in this case were public shade trees, but if they are, they still have to still have to follow the entire process, including noticing the tree's removal or potential removal on tree, a, a preliminary hearing, which is usually before the tree committee, and then any necessary uh, further hearing before the select. Great. Thank you. And, uh, so that takes care of that. And, uh, and, and I'm, I'm going to think of whether I should back up to seven, because we did the future meetings for January and February, we, but I did want to talk about the, uh, the meetings for December. Is that a hand up, Mr. Nope. Okay, uh, so um, I had um, a while ago suggested that we start doing all remote in, in December, January, and February, essentially meteorological winter. You know, and so I asked folks to consider that. You know, I actually had meant to bring it up at the last meeting. You know, I did not. You know, so I just want to see how people feel about that. You know, and and so uh, my inclination in, is in, I think I think we can have our cake and eat it too, at least for me. And that is, if folks want to come, you know, I'm fine with, with being remote, you know, and everyone else here. I mean, I kind of want to try it, to be honest, you know. Uh, the other thing is that we, we, can, we can play it by ear, you know. And to that, I would ask Mr. Heim, me, at what point we would need to decide me, where a meeting is going to be located. Because let's say by the time the agenda gets posted, be, it's very clear that there's a high probability or a decent probability that the weather is going to be awful on the day of a meeting, you know, then we could just decide to do that uh, remotely. But if we have more time to make that decision, then that would be even better. And so, Mr. Heim? So generally speaking, you've got the 48 hours that you have for posting any meeting to sort of set what the location of that meeting is. Um, if there's an emergency or there are conditions that might allow you to shift a meeting's location rather than um, cancel the meeting, that's a new option available that wasn't there before. That's really about shortening the time frame rather than expanding it. So I think as long as the board determines where it wants to meet, either virtually in a virtual space, in, in person, or in a hybrid format, um, within the, before you post your agenda, that's really all you need to do. Um, I don't, there's the, the legislature is currently considering some different options for rendering the remote meeting possibility as a more permanent um, status quo or a permanent option. I'm not very clear. I know Mr. Pooler was talking to department heads about that this morning. I'm not very clear exactly what the parameters of that are going to be like, whether it's just going to be affording more latitude and flexibility or it's going to resemble a continuation. I will say that as most of you recall, unfortunately these legislative decisions have not necessarily been made well in advance. They've oftentimes been made at the 11th hour when we've been, you know, because I think there's a lot of complications that go into it. There may be other people have more insight than I do with respect to that. But it hasn't, we haven't gotten a lot of lead time on those, but it may be the legislature, because they're considering a more permanent change, is ahead of the game on this. I'm just not sure. Right. You know, so um, I'm not sure what more to say in, at this point, in, other than to ask my colleagues if they want to say anything, say any preferences. Mr. Hart. I mean, I'd much prefer to be in here. <laughs> I. I think my thoughts on remote meetings is well documented, but I certainly understand, I mean, that people have different opinions on this. I think our meetings run smoother, especially during war and article season. I mean, I'd like to at some point have the discussion about allowing people to come in and really let our meetings run smoother, but I certainly am fine if we kind of continue on the, our, the tracks that we are. I mean, I think this board has existed for many, many years in a cold climate and <laughs> has somehow 
managed to put their meetings together. So I think we could figure it out. Um, but I don't like sitting in my basement and staring at the computer. I'd much rather be looking at your fine faces in this room. So. From the other Mr. Hurd. <laughs> um, I feel similarly in that um, I think I find a better experience here as we've been doing it. I've appreciated the flexibility when for health reasons I need to be remote. The hybrid format served us well. And um, so for me, I'm pretty happy with the status quo. I think we would we have the, the technology flexibility to account for weather or a dramatic change in the public health situation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I, I agree with my colleagues. I, I, I think, and again, it's up to each individual member. If, if you are in a situation where you can't make the meeting, you have the flexibility. But I mean, I think as a board, I think the meetings run much better when we're here in person. And, and I think it also sends a message to the public too that we're coming in to do the town's business here. Um, again, individual members, there may be a meeting that you can't make it, but you can make it remotely. And it's nice now to have that flexibility. And I think it's up to individual members. But I mean, I think if we're taking a vote as to whether you'd per prefer to be here or have a remote meeting, I would much prefer to be here right. to have the meeting. All right. Well, you know, so I, I hope, well, I, 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 like I said, I have to do the experiment of me running me remotely. I just have to, you know, yes, Mr. Hein. Yeah. So I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, just one wrinkle is that typically if you're having an in-person meeting, the, and, and, and a minority of members are participating remotely, someone who's in person would run the meeting. Just so that's something that maybe we can discuss some more in terms of the parameters. So typically the person who's leading the meeting in a hybrid context under the way that the open meeting law has worked previously with respect to remote participation, you would hand that off to your vice chair if there's a quorum of folks in person. We've been operating under the emergency rules, which are a little different, but I just want to give the board the heads up that um, that's something that may or may not be tweaked or changed over time, depending on how it goes. So I I'd be happy to discuss it more. So wait, so are you saying that that's not possible for me to run it remotely or that we don't know? So typically under the law, you would, if, if there's a quorum of folks in person, right. the, 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 the person who is remote would not run the meeting remotely. Um, under the suspension of the rules, everything's kind of like fair game. Mm -hmm. So uh, it may be possible for you to run it remotely even though you're the member who's not in attendance. Right. Um, if that's what you're sort of suggesting mm -hmm. for the interim period. Mm -hmm. Yes. But I'm, I'm not sure that that will last. But I guess what you're sort of talking about is a pilot this winter. So. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, because I'm assuming that, I mean, who knows what's going to happen after March? I mean, okay. the, 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 yeah, I mean, who knows? I mean, it'll probably. Yeah, who knows? You know, so, all right. Well, well, well. Let's 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 look into that because you know, um, first off, I mean, I just want the challenge of doing it. I think I think it will be easier actually for for because for me, I mean, I understand how people feel, but for me, I find that the the virtual is easier for me because I can see everyone. I mean, I can I can actually read the room better, you know, um, on the screen because I can see everyone at once as opposed to being in the middle and kind of swiveling back and forth and having people pointing to me that someone has their hand up, you know, and, and the convenience, it just can't beat that, you know. Uh, uh, and so uh, I, I just get so much more done you know, when I can stay you know, at the lab and then hop into a meeting you know, and then after the meeting go back and do some more work and then, and then head home. So, so to the extent I can do that, you know, I will, you know, uh, because I think it's great I mean, for folks to, because I think we can have our, we can do it all. I mean, it's all, it, people are here who want to be here. I mean, and, and I will be remote when I want to be remote. Because I mean, it's not, not, not saying that I'll do every meeting uh, remotely uh, through February. Because as I mentioned when I first brought this up, I, mean, I think it would be good in February I mean, to start discussing bringing people back into the room I mean, uh, for uh, March when we will do the hearings for the articles, you know, and so plan is definitely come back then and, and have people here given the conditions, you know, I uh, mean, if, um, uh, so, so, um, so that's where we are, but if it doesn't work out and, and, and I need to be here, well, it wouldn't be the first time I don't get what I want, you know, <laughs> so, so, you know, the steal, you know, so, 
uh, and, and certainly I'm happy to have this discussion with you all because I know the chair can do what the chair wants me, but as I told Mrs. Mahan, what I want <coughs> to do is find out what other people want to do and try to maximize, you know, happiness. It, uh, so, all right, you know, so uh, we've taken care of that, you know, and on to correspondence received, you know, so we have um, number nine, concerns regarding a crosswalk at Park Ave and Oakland Ave uh, by Barbara Thornton. You know. Motion to receive and refer to TAC. Second that. All right. So on a motion by Mr. Helmus and a second by Mr. On a motion by Mr. Hurd and a second by Mr. Helmus. Almost. <laughs> so, so. Uh, Mr. Heim. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Corsi. Yes. Mr. Hellman. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Unanimous vote. All right. Great. So we, we now go to this business. Ms. Meyer. No new business. Thank you. Mr. Heim. No new business. Thank you. Mr. Fuller. No new business. Thank you. And Mr. Corsi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, a few things. First, first, I would like to extend condolences to Mrs. Mahan on her mother has passed away since our last meeting and, and um, the, the wake and funeral was last week's. Our condolences to Diane and, and, and her family. Um, the second thing I'd like to bring up, um, I am, the, as you know, the liaison to the Council on Aging and I attended a meeting last week and there were some interesting, really had an interesting discussion on, on a number of issues, but one of the um, thing I'd like to follow up with Mr. Pooler uh, on and I asked the question this evening of Mr. Mann about how many individuals uh, use the tax deferral program. He said 16 to 18. And there's a relationship on, and that's on property tax deferral for people who qualify. There's also a senior circuit breaker that's available to people. Um, but if you elect the deferral, you don't qualify for the circuit breaker, even though you, you might hit the income limits. And there, there was some discussion about if there's any way that perhaps we could, through the town, talk to our legislative delegation to see if there is a way to try to harmonize the two so that you're not electing one at the expense of the other um, because under the deferral program you are obligated to pay the tax and it's usually on a transfer. Um, but I think it's something that would require, um, it might require home rule, might, I don't know exactly what it would require but I thought it was a a really good idea and something that uh, we, we should perhaps look into. Um, the other thing that, that came up, and, and this may be more for the community, is with the increases that we're seeing now in fuel costs and, and home heating and the, the strain on people with fixed incomes is, is much, much greater and they are finding that the number of requests that they're receiving for fuel assistance help is, is way up compared to, to other years. So again, this is something that I, I think I'll follow up with Mr. Pooler and, and, and Ms. Bongiorno. I know there are programs that are available both through the Council on Aging with the town, with some charitable organizations, but I think it's, it's something worth um, looking into because I think this is gonna be a particularly challenging year. Thank you. Thank you. And, and lastly, just wanna wish everybody happy Thanksgiving. Thank you, Mr. Horsey. Mr. Hurd. Thank you. I'll echo Mr. DeCourcy's comments about Mrs. Mahan's mother. Our condolences to her and her family. Um, if you saw me on my phone, I wasn't being rude texting while you were talking. I was I wanted to verify the date that I'm about to say. Um, I'm happy to say, the past couple of years, I've had a lot of people reach out to me and liken Arlington to the Ebenezer Scrooge of the neighboring towns for holiday celebrations and holiday lightings. So this year, we have a, a beautification committee that has come and is going to have that uh, put together a plan for holiday lighting throughout Arlington Center and whatnot. And we have the return of first lights, which is going to be on December 1st in Woodmore Park, rain date of Friday, December 2nd. But we have um, a lighting of the park, performance by the Arlington High School Honors Orchestra in performance by Arlington High School Magical Singers. So it should be a fun event and certainly fun for kids of all ages and a good night to come and patronize some of the Arlington businesses. It's done in coordinate, coordination with the Arlington Tourism and Economic Development Committee and um, the Arlington Chamber of Commerce as well as a number of sponsors. So it should be a good event and hopefully spread some holiday cheer in Arlington that we haven't had in the past couple of years. So. Looking forward to that. 
Great. Thank you, Mr. Hart. Helmut. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I also extend our, my condolences to our friend Diane, and uh, I know this is a difficult time and that our thoughts are with her and her, her father and her, the rest of the family. Last night, my husband Jordan and I were honored to attend the Arlington Vigil, observing the Transgender Day of Remembrance. It was sponsored by the town's Rainbow Commission, the Human Rights Commission, and the Disability Commission, and generously hosted in the lawn of First Paris Universal, Universal, Unitarian Universalist Church. In light of the horrifying event in Colorado Springs this weekend, I'd like to read a slightly expanded version of my remarks from last night. So last night I said, so tonight, just four hours from now, LGBTQ people and their allies in Colorado Springs were planning to observe Transgender Day of Remembrance at the Club Q nightclub. Instead, they are reeling from a violent, deadly attack in that vibrant, diverse, and friendly space, an attack that injured and killed members of the queer community, their friends and allies. Amid a fresh round of rage and grief, it is hard to know what to feel and think, and it's even harder to know what to say. But words matter. Speaking our truth matters. Living our truth matters more than ever in moments like this that shake us. We don't know much yet about the twisted mind of the shooter, but we know what is happening around this country the rights and visibility of the LGBT community are the latest political wedge in the culture wars. Politicians and pundits are spreading lies in fear about us to score cheap political points, to gain power, to deflect the blame for social and economic problems onto innocent people who just want to live their lives, our lives. Words matter. The words of these morally bankrupt individuals have fanned the flames of fear and hate, fueling a rise in threats and violence against members of this community, especially transgender people and their families, including right here in eastern Massachusetts. So we mourn and honor the memory of those who have lost their life to this violence, but we also honor and celebrate the resilience of the amazing Arlington residents who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex, allies, and more. People who are so much more than that acronym. And to that community, I say this. The town of Arlington is committed to seeing you, supporting you, and protecting you. We stand with you against the hate and lies we honor the courage it takes to speak and to live the simple truth about who you are. And we will do our very best to make Arlington a safe and welcoming place. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Thomas, I mean, that was great, you know, and very touching, very well spoken. Yes. You know, and, and, um, and Arlington is a very welcoming place, you know, and, and so we'll, we'll continue to be such mean and try to be even more so. And so thank you. And, and, and um, my, um, my new business is really um, pretty um, just kind of simple. And, uh, so, uh, and so I just wanted to let you know that we are going to have an update in, on the town manager search in um, next meeting. And, uh, we're making good progress on that. And, and um, last time I had said in I want to kind of understand the, um, our tree, our posture towards trees, meaning for us to start um, <coughs> maybe thinking about doing something a little more substantial um, with the Arlington Tree Committee. And, um, and I had a preliminary conversation with Mr. Helmuth you know, last week, and, and so I think I'm going to want to move forward with that a little bit more. I had a little conversation with Mr. Pooler uh, today also. so. So um, I think I'm going to have a real item on the agenda um, next meeting. And so in preparation for that, if you want to read the tree management plan on the um, ArlingtonTree.org um, site, if you go to our website and go to Arlington Tree Committee, then there's a link to their site that has the tree plan. That will be a good starting point. And, um, so um, that's pretty much 
it uh, for me. And so I'm just going to um, end with the land acknowledgement. You know, normally I just do this once a month, you know, uh, but since um, it is just before Thanksgiving, I mean, I think it's kind of <coughs> a little more um, appropriate this time to end the meeting thinking about uh, the land acknowledgement. And so we acknowledge that the town of Arlington is located on the ancestral lands of the Massachusetts tribe, the tribe of indigenous peoples from whom the colony, province, and commonwealth have taken their names. We pay our respects to the ancestral bloodline of the Massachusetts tribe and their descendants who still inhabit historic Massachusetts territories today. So on that, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. So on a motion by Mr. How? Mr. Hurd, <laughs> and the second by Mr. DeCourcy. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Hellman. Yes. Mr. Dickens. Yes. Thank you.